This episode of The Candid Frame is sponsored by Charcoal Book Club. The Charcoal Book Club is the monthly subscription service for photo book enthusiasts. Working with the most respected names in contemporary photography, Charcoal selects and delivers essential photo books to a worldwide community of collectors. Each month, members receive a signed first edition monograph and an exclusive print to add to their collections. Join the club by visiting charcoalbookclub.com and use the promo code THECANDERFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. I have been blessed with good friendships in my life, for which I'm very grateful. Some of them have been as a direct result of The Candid Frame, which was an unexpected benefit of producing this show. However, one of the people who has become a significant linchpin in my life goes back all the way to high school, where he was one of my teachers. He wasn't a photography teacher, but a drama teacher, who during his short tenure left a lifelong impression on me. William Allen Young is an actor who is best known for his character of Frank Mitchell, the patriarch of the family on the popular 90s sitcom Moesha. His credits include a long list of television programs and films, not least of which are This Is Us, Cold Black, District 9, and A Soldier's Story. But for me, he's been a mentor and an emotional touchstone that has provided me great insight into what it means to be a man and an artist. We share a wonderful synchronicity that has made our conversation special for the both of us. So I thought that I would finally record one of our conversations for you. I hope you take as much from it as we do. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. So how are you, brother? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. Considering that we're all in the same boat. It's uh, it's wonderful just to be able to say that you're good, that you're in good health, that uh, you're in good spirits. And that to me is a victory. That to me is is a success right now. Anything else somebody is doing is just icing on the cake. So I've got my cake and uh, some icing, too. And you still got your figure. So that's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> You start you start counting the little mini blessings now, but that that's what's so good about something like a pandemic. It just it reminds me of how special those little things are. So I'm really fortunate to have all that stuff and to reappreciate all of it. That's good. Well, I appreciate having a moment like this. It's always good when I have yeah. a chance to sit down and talk with you. Don't do it often enough, but every time I do do it, I come away with it just so fulfilled and enriched, and I just want to. Thank you for the uh, the past moments and for this one. Yeah, same, man, same. I, I think that one of the things that's so interesting about going to the watering hole and getting filled up with r- uh, relationships and conversations with certain people, I'm surprised that we don't do it more often. I just, because it's, it, it's a no-brainer. There's no question about the fact that it does something good for us. So I think we just have to really be intentional and conscious of going back to that water and hole, especially when we need to be filled up. Yeah. I was having a conversation with someone today and realized that how, how much more important having touch tones like this are in my life. Hmm. Yeah. And that I think I need them even more now because it's it's so easy to get caught up in in the craziness it is it is if all your sort of contact points are relate, related to the craziness it really is hard to pull back the reins yeah. get centered and to have a healthy perspective about the stuff that really does matter yeah and in in fact i think the reverse then is also true i think that the therapist that we are looking for to deal with the craziness is right in the room. Oh yeah. It's one of these things that again, back to what I said about the watering hole, it's right there. We literally have access to it and we forget. It's like um, my conversations with you here, I have been among the most dynamic, the most revealing and, and good feeling. So I know that that's there. Mm-hmm. So I got to remember, I, I can't forget. I have several watering holes around me. And when those crazies hit, I'm blessed to have that. Now I just have to access it 
And that's easy. Just got to pick up the phone, got to, you know, do that. Yeah. When I was younger, I liked that. And, and that really had an impact on me. And there are a variety of reasons why, why that was, was the case. And one of the things that allowed me to really connect to you when I met you yeah. was the fact that you came up in a neighborhood much like mine. You know, yeah, I grew up on yeah. 65th Figueroa, mm -hmm. you and Nickerson Gardens, yeah, yeah. you know, and I saw someone who looked like me. And it wasn't so much that you had worked as an actor that I had seen you on television and movies. It was the fact that you, you held yourself with a level of, of dignity and sincerity that I really admired. Oh, and man. though I, I, I certainly had people in my life that, you know, who worked hard and did and, and, and you know, did things and accomplished yeah. things, yeah. there was something aspirational in terms of who you were. Yeah. And I think it was the first time that I had, I had met someone who looked like me, who had qualities that I wanted to have. Yeah. yeah. So I wish I'd had the wherewithal to talk to you in, in those terms, but it was, yeah. I was young. It was, and I, I wasn't as thoughtful then as I <laughs> as like to think I am now, but yeah. I, I'm wondering about, about you because, you know, you face similar circumstances, you know, and you had your aspirations to become an actor, but yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, those kind of kinds, what kinds of touchstones that did you have? Cause I know you admired, you know, yeah. people, actors, yeah. Like Jeremy Zell Jones, Sidney Poitier. But in terms of in your immediate orbit, w what were the touchstones that allowed you to sort of maintain your hope for the kind of life that you have now? That's a really good question. I think that what I tried to do is to, first of all, just determine who within my sphere I could go to because I, I wanted to go to them. I was not shy about if I had identified that person or those people. I would rush to them. And the few that I did, that's exactly what I did. And I think I overwhelmed them. Um, my, <laughs> it, I realized it wasn't going to be in my family. It wasn't going to be my mother, my father, my sisters, my brothers. They, we were just, it, it wasn't going to happen there. So every drama teacher, my first drama teacher, Robert Crumb, Caucasian man at Gompers Middle School, where I just where the bug just jumped in me and I realized I want this path. He kicked me out of the play, the play that I finally landed the part in that, that gave me this thing that, oh, I found it. I found my watering mm -hmm. hole and he kicked me out and he called my mother because my mother was upset because she knew how excited I was about a drama. I found it. And he told her very simply, he said, every time I put him on stage and tell him to go to the back, before the number is over, he's moved to the front. Every time he looks at the script and there's nothing for him but one line, he ad libs a line. And he says he's just, he's got this tremendous ego. He wants to be in front. He wants to take over everything. So I'm kicking him out of the play. And I'm recalling this to you now as really one of the first really painful moments of my life because I had reached out, you know, every time you reach out, you make yourself vulnerable because mm -hmm. yeah. you could be rejected. And this man rejected me. I guess as I grew older, I understood it from his vantage point. He's trying to direct a play and there's lots of these young kids in there and he's, you know, choreographing and all that. And this one kid is kind of saying, see me, see me. Yeah. I was that kid. I was desperately trying to find myself and and aspire to these dreams i had and this i latched onto this man not realizing that he might reject me and after that rejection i really felt more so like i'm going to have to just walk this path myself but without resources i'll never make it and then my high school drama coach was just the opposite uh tc lee and she grabbed me and said william what are you waiting for let's say she saw the stuff in me and the more she came to me, I came to her mm -hmm. and everything just started to happen that way. So it was just, I, I raised my hand in Mr. Wooden's class and he asked the question, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? And everybody had to go around in alphabetical order and say what it was 
that that they wanted to do. Yeah. And I raised my hand and everybody else was given the standard answers, doctor, lawyer, police officer, whatever. I'm the only one that said, I want to be a professional actor. And I remember the students laughing at me. And I remember Mr. Wooden, bless his heart, uh, immediately responded, said, no, 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 no. Nobody laughs at anybody's dream here because you never know what anybody's going to be able to do. And I heard his words, but I was so crushed. Yeah. I went into my shell anyway. So again, I realized even among my peers, I couldn't share it. So with Mr. Crumb, I stopped talking about it. I, I, I went to music because I wasn't in the play anymore. Uh, at Lock, I stopped talking about it. And I grabbed T.C. Lee, Miss Lee. I grabbed her. She's the only one. She took me to my first audition and I got a role in, in a film and made uh, $50 a day and I wanted to pay her some. She said, absolutely not. I'm just <laughs> doing my role. You have to understand that I'm here to do this for you. And she never accepted any money. And so those were the kinds of people. And as I, as I grew as an artist, I kept that thinking of, don't reach out to everybody. It's not going to be beneficial for yeah. you. And I just, anybody who came to me, Eva, I came, I came running to them. I was, I was a counterpuncher. If somebody showed me that, hey, I see you. I believe in you. Oh, man, I embraced them because I was so desperate to get to first base. And every one of those ones that I, I could literally plot the stepping stones that appeared in my life, mm -hmm. they just appeared. Yeah. And they appeared when I needed them most. Yeah, I had the exact, the exact same experience in different different parts of my my life yeah. whether it was as a writer or as a photographer or with you as an as an actor yeah. it was just being seen hmm. feeling like oh my god i'm doing this thing and then have someone recognize that it is something to be celebrated that it's a yeah. strength yeah. and that's incredibly powerful especially when you're in a world where everyone is on guard because even if you're not involved in drugs or gangs and stuff like that, everybody is on edge, you yeah. know? There's this sort of yeah. systematic, constant trauma that's always happening. It's always yeah. around. It's always in the air. Yeah. And that you know you're always vulnerable to it, yeah. right? And so yeah. there's this guardedness yeah. that I think everybody everybody has in, in, in the neighborhood. So when you do latch on to something that you feel is precious to you, yeah. you're very protective of it. Yeah. But when you see, when someone recognizes it in you, that hunger that you wanted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, mm -hmm. is, is just, it's magnified all the more. Well, you know, I mean, not only is what you're saying true, it applies to you and me both, because in our relationship, you may not recall this because it's from my perspective, when I met you and here you were, this talented young man in a high school setting, and I felt that in you. I really felt without you having to articulate it, this kid wants something and it's yeah. beyond where we are and, 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 and how we are and what we are. It's beyond that. And I could only recognize it because I had it in me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if I was quite in the position to do much for you. I was struggling myself at the time, but I just remember it was the foundation for our relationship. Yeah. If you'll recall, I came to your home. Yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Not as your teacher anymore, but literally as kind of a an accepted member of your family. And at that time, I began to sort of check out your situation. And I thought, as you mentioned earlier, you and I were really on parallel journeys and me being older. But I could just see looking back that your situation was so similar to mine. And that's why I embraced you as a mentee. And to this day why I'm sure you and I continue to have such a great relationship. I don't know that that's, that someone is always in a position who has gone through that to see in somebody that they might be able to inspire the same thing that they saw in themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's rare because I, I know we all have opportunities when we're putting ourselves out there, we're being really sincere and genuine about what we do and sharing about it, that we're able to impact other people in really good ways. I hear that all a lot, you know, about people being appreciative of the work that I do and how it's changed their lives. But every once in a while, you know, you connect with someone who's where it's reciprocal. 
Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and to me, those are those dynamic moments. You you never forget those. And and sometimes even life-changing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Your mother, I've, you know, you've talked so much about your mother yeah. and how much of an impact she, she was. She didn't finish high school. Mm-hmm. She I guess she got her GED at some point, but she worked as a maid mm-hmm. to... To help raise your kid, raise you and your and your siblings. Yeah, seven and, of us. Yeah, not easy. Yeah. My mom, after my parents got divorced, she was working as a, a maid for for a while, which I had, yeah. had. talk about having issues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. With, with right, right. Yeah, yeah. But I think the the strength of that woman you you've talked about, but yeah. in terms of. What you learned from her, not so much in terms of what she told you, but just from observing the way your mother, how your mother lived, how she held herself. You know, what were this, the gifts that you got from from that? Well, to me, I first of all, I'm, I'm very much like her. So I saw qualities in her that for some reason made sense to me. I, they, they resonated with me as not being foreign. It was just part of my mm. DNA, too. One of those was that my mother never complained. She really never had a childhood. She had her first child young and began being a mother. But even before that, she was a mother to her older brothers. I mean, to her younger brothers and sisters when her mother passed away. And so she had to take care of them she had to drop out of school and all of that. So never had a childhood. And only when I was doing a documentary film on her just a few years ago, did she finally break down in tears about the lost childhood? Mm. Never complained in, in decades of an experience. So she was always busy in the foxhole working, always responsible, always taking care of whatever needed to be taken care of. And even when she'd come to these unfathomable abysses in her life, she just, she never screamed, never shouted. She just sort of looked at it and went, went to the drawing board and came up with some crude response and just began doing it. And I saw that event after event, year after year, when my dad uh, passed away and I get the call at one or two o'clock in the morning and my brothers and sisters and I said, let's go tell mama. And we go tell her mm. and we were there in, in, in unison because we were ready to catch her when she fell. And we said, mama, papa didn't make it. And she sat up in bed and she didn't say anything. And I said, mama, and she held up one finger and I knew she heard me. We just watched her slowly get out of bed, go over to the window, look out into the night. And then all of a sudden turn and clapped her hands above her head. And she said, well, all right. And then she sat down and said, here's what we do. And she called so-and-so by she didn't even grieve in the moment. She went right to taking care of it. Mm-hmm. Now I say that to see this, say, say this, not only did I see that in her, I began to believe that's the way you have to handle things, especially if you're the leader of a family, if you're, if you're respected, if you're somebody who's responsible. You don't have time to do those things. You don't allow yourself the time. Yeah. And, so, and, I, and, and, I, and, and I'm sure there's, there's a, a price you pay for that. But because of that, I mirror my mother in many ways. I respected the fact that she didn't fall apart in front of us. Because when she was a single parent with seven kids, if she had done that, Eva, I cannot begin to imagine what would have happened to us. Mm -hmm. So she paid the price. She sacrificed. It, it, It was a sacrifice. But because of that sacrifice and me observing it, I have not not only such profound respect and love for my mother for the sacrifice, but I've taken on some of those characteristics as a man, as a as a husband, as a as a father. And I'm sure I'll pay or I have paid something of a price, maybe not to the level that my mother has, but yeah. That was powerful. And she never ever told me this about who she was. To your question, I saw it. And when I saw it, I was taking notes. And that's what to this day, my, my mother is the strongest person I know. This woman, not that big, never carried a gun, no threat to anybody, just, you know, whatever the Gandhis and the, and the Mandelas and the Dr. Kings and people like that carry, she was of that spirit. Yeah. And that's how I realized people who have very little 
who constantly are dealt the blow after blow after blow in life, Katrina, poverty, uh, racism, all of those things. And you wonder, how do they survive? How do they, they have nothing. They don't have the pot or the window. How do they make it? Yeah. I saw it in my mother. And I'm absolutely clear. That's how we all, those of us who had to struggle out of the pit, that's how we survived. We didn't lose it. We didn't add a sacrifice, of course, emotionally. And that's why, like you said earlier, you you get to these points where you you need to find a watering hole. Yeah. Because that's the therapy, I think, which is the balance to being that kind of person. And I think when you witness that, it gives you a perspective when the issue is, oh, I didn't get this job. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. In fact, it, it's interesting you say that, even because when students ask me, young acting students ask me, how do you handle the rejection, Mr. Young? And I think for a moment and I smile and the image of my mother comes in. Mm. And I'm thinking, is this all they got? <laughs> <laughs> it would take a lot more than that to knock me down. I'm Joan Walker's son. Yeah. I'm Roger Young's son. If, if a role is the only thing that you can take away from me, you haven't even scratched the surface of what I'm capable of withstanding. And that's why 30, 40 years into the business, I've been rejected thousands of times, literally. Mm -hmm. And I'm still standing. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't do honor to my mother. And my father, I wouldn't do honor to my DNA yeah. if I would crumble for something that. And so when I give them that perspective, which many of them don't have, they straighten up because they realize, even though you may not have my story, you may not have my mother, there's something in your life which is the stone, the mm -hmm. bedrock, you find that and hold on to that and use that the next time somebody denies you a role. Go to your bedrock and find that strength. You won't crumble and you can't because you got to go to the next audition and the next and the next. Yeah, I have found, I guess for the last 10 or 15 years, that the more clarity I have about what I want, what I want in terms of my creativity, what I want from... Hmm. You know, from my photography, from my writing, from my podcasting, yeah. from just just being a man. Right? Yeah. Once I've gotten that more that greater clarity in terms of what I want, rejection becomes less of an issue for me. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. it's like this is what I want. I'm going to create this regardless of what anyone says or does, hmm. and hmm. that it's not reliant on someone else making a choice. I think that's the key, but I think you just hit it right there. I really do believe to the extent that the, we give away our power, yeah, which is to say we give someone else permission to determine our happiness, uh, our, our fulfillment, our satisfaction, our success, to define it for us. To that extent, we have left ourselves completely vulnerable, completely absent of our center. Our compass is so off uh, 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 north that... We then now are at the hands of people who most often don't have our best interest at heart, mm -hmm. which makes it even worse. And so to the degree at that point, since we've given them that power, to the degree that they sign off yeah. on what we want, our dreams, our being, our very existence, then we feel validated. But to the degree that we do the opposite, which is what you just said, no, just be clear on what we want how we define ourselves, what our goals are and why, mm -hmm. the more clear we are on that, almost like a character in a play or in a movie, any narrative, once that character hones in on their, their, their purpose, their clarity, they are as powerful as they ever are in the story, which is why usually you meet the character as being very vulnerable and unsure in the beginning. And that revelation, that certainty, that clarity comes later in the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they are to be reckoned with. And that's why I say we take back our power at that, that moment. But that clarity is not easy to come by. We need oh, to be no, still. that's hard one. Right, right, That's hard right. one, because I, yeah. I, most of my, what I used to consider my regrets, or moments that I wish had never happened, usually had to do where 
I made the choice to not do things the way I knew I needed to do them, hmm. but changed it to accommodate what someone else said I had to do and the way I had to do it. Exactly. And I would, I would shut my mouth and I would go, okay. And it was a miserable experience each and every time. Yeah. And even if I was able to produce work that was acceptable to them, yeah. There was a there was an experience of feeling like I had let myself down. Yeah. So yeah. even if I had gotten a check for it. Yeah. Right. There was just this feeling like I, you know, I just there was just a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. Well, you think know, about the double. Yeah, yeah. Well, think about the double gut punch. You put yourself out there. You sell yourself out, so to speak, just to use that phrase. Yeah. And you get rejected. So mm. now, yeah. now you're, 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 you're beating yourself up for surrendering your soul, so to speak. And even after you did that, to get the, the job, to get the money, whatever, then they deny you. And then the double uh, whammy hits you. And those are the times when I think people kind of finally come to the position of, I don't like feeling like this. I don't want to feel this way anymore. And that's where I think that journey to find your purpose begins because it, that pain nobody wants to have, uh, especially uh, at the price of surrendering what, what, what you have. I got an offer years ago for to do a movie, and it was the first time I was going to get a million dollar check. Now, I'm not going to name the athlete. But one of the producers, I was told, was, was an athlete who I had great respect for. So I thought, this is an offer? They said, yes, yes, but it shoots in Japan. So I said, okay, fine, I'd love to see the script. So they send the script over, the money is there, I'm gonna shoot in Japan, I'm gonna co-star opposite the Japanese actress who was like the up and coming mm -hmm. star. Now she was really a model that they were trying to make the next Japanese star. So this was going to be the vehicle to do it. Okay. And they needed, she had to star opposite this black sailor, the character in the film. And so they found me, I was on a contract to Columbia pictures at the time. So I get the script. The script was one of the most stereotypical, degrading, dehumanizing, emasculating story I had ever seen in terms of a character, and that this character was black, was so offensive to me. The things that he was doing, that, that she didn't have to do, that no other character had to do, I just went page after page, just not believing somebody would write it, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, that somebody would put their money behind it to produce it. Her character was gonna look great at the expense of this young black man who, whose daddy was a pimp and he was naked halfway during the film and he's, he's running around grabbing his stuff and he just, it, was, it was senseless. And then I thought about this, this athlete and I'm thinking, why would he be involved in this? He's, he's too conscious. Well, the truth was he had never seen the script. He had, it was an investment for him that his, his managers, his agents, mm. his lawyers, whoever it was, had told him to get involved in because it was going to make money. And so I told my agents, there's no way I'm going to do it, but can you set up the meeting? Because I'd love to go in and, and talk to them. They said, why talk to them if you're just going to turn them down? I said, because this is something I want to do. Yeah. Because so, they said, you know, somebody else is going to do this. And I said, yeah, I know, but it won't be me. So I gave up money. It, it would have been a career changer. I had never had a role of, of that potential visibility before. Right. I'd done a soldier story, but that was an ensemble. But this one was going to be starring opposite, right? I turned it down. I walked away from a million dollars when I needed a hundred thousand or <laughs> 10,000 or 5,000. Yeah. But to me, that was one of those that was one of those self-check moments, Eva, where all of us have to have a defining moment in our lives where you suddenly discover beyond question who you are. Yeah. I ain't talking about who you want to be, who you think you are, any of that. Only those moments where it's literally in your hand, you can take it. You can walk, like you said, you walk away with the check and you still feel bad. Mm -hmm. It's one of those where, 
well, well, I could do it. I could, I could use this money and I'll start a nonprofit. I'll do you start trying to justify it in every way. But when that film comes out, I would have been part of this dehumanization. And more importantly, I would have played the role. I said yes to it. I, it, it was my 30 pieces of gold to, to, to sell my soul. And I wasn't ready to do that. And that's when I found out about what kind of man I really am, that I really, really am. And I'm that man to this day. Did you have a moment early in your career where that choice was a, was a, was a struggle? Where, because you were so hungry to yeah. have an opportunity to perform, where that decision to do something that you would not take now, but that it was difficult to, to say yes or no to? Good question. I cannot recall a struggle. I mean, maybe the maybe the part of the reason is because because of my look, I didn't fit the stereotypical types of roles, the the thug, the pimp and that mm -hmm. which which were rampant at the time. There were actually more of those roles for black actors when I was getting started to go up for than there were the other roles, the doctors, the the you know, the professor, that kind of thing. So when I went up, I went for those, I went up usually for those other roles, a teacher, a um, a father. Uh, I mean, you look at my role on Moesha for six years, Frank Mitchell, mm -hmm. uh, middle class, strong father, tough but loving. I mean, so I had the advantage of just by my look alone, most of the roles that I was being offered were the kinds of roles where I wouldn't have said no because they were completely degraded. The, the film uh, script that I told you about was an exception. It was, yeah. you know, so I didn't really have to turn down a lot because they were dehumanizing stereotypes. But I did walk away from some. And for those reasons, it may not have been as bad as that feature film script. But I just looked at it and just thought, no, I don't want to do this. I just, I don't want to do it. Now, I remember saying that when I only had, I went to the bank, I had been, it was a low moment and I had been living off of credit cards and just waiting for the phone to ring to kind of turn it around and I could pay off my debt. But um, the phone wasn't ringing. So I go to the ATM machine and there was 37 cents in there. I had miscalculated and, you know, yeah. and uh, I was married and I didn't want to let my wife know that I wasn't doing better that we weren't doing better because it's a we then. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I had told her she, she didn't like the job she was in. Uh, she had her degree, she got a job she mm -hmm. didn't like, she realized that's not what I need to do. And so I told her, you quit then because I can see what this is doing to your soul every night you bring it home with you, you quit. And she said, but I said, no, 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 don't worry. I'll take care of us. You quit. I'll carry us until you get your degree. You go back and get your master's, which you did. And I'll carry us. Now, think about this. I told this woman that. Yeah. And then I got 37 cents in the bank. And those are the low moments where, again, it's a gut check time. And you you wonder if that if the pimp roll comes, if the, do you take <laughs> it just just to. You couldn't really blame the man much who does that mm -hmm. because, you know, there but for the sake of God, you, you just don't know if you may be in his shoes. It was the next day, a Wednesday, where the phone rang and one of my agents, Jimmy Cota, uh, said, well, they want you to come in and do a, a screen test for this, this project. And I said, well, OK, what's the project? When do I go? He tells me the name of the project. Uh, that was on a Wednesday. I go in on Friday. They're going to make the decision Monday. And I book it. And it changed my life. Wow. The other role didn't come along, Eva, to test me. So I don't know if I would have said, even in those situations, mm -hmm. if I may have just sort of said, you know, God, forgive me, you know, allow my moral compass to slip a little bit yeah. because I have to I have to pay my bills. But fortunately, that didn't show up. That opportunity didn't present itself. And I didn't have to compromise, even if I would have. Uh, and then instead, what came was the ship that uh, I didn't even know was coming. And my life has been a succession of the ship comes in. It just comes in every yeah. time.
During my most recent workshop, we talked about the importance of culling and organizing one's images for the purposes of a portfolio, zine, or a book. Using some examples from my own library, I shared the importance of selection and sequencing, layout and design. When one moves from displaying a single image, the design choices that go into a collection of photographs are just as important as the decisions that lead to the creation of the photographs themselves. When a new book arrives at the studio, it's those design choices that give me an even greater appreciation of the photographic process. There are wonderful moments of recognition when you see the power that lies in juxtaposing two images opposite each other on a spread. Together, they deliver an energy and a resonance that they couldn't produce alone. It's one of the reasons why I love photo books and why I'm glad to have Charcoal Book Club as a sponsor. They understand what makes books so special, and it drives them to make quality monographs accessible and affordable. Charcoal Book Club curates and offers books from great contemporary photographers. And when you become a member, each month you'll receive a copy of a new book and a collectible print to add to your collection. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. And if you're not feeling that month's selection, it's okay. You can swap it out for a different one of a similar value. Visit their website to see what they have to offer and what you have to look forward to. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today. And remember to use the code VCANDRITFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. And thanks to the many of you who support The Candid Frame financially. Your contributions have helped us so much over the past year during a very challenging time. It's financial contributions like yours that have allowed us to improve the show over these many years and provides me the much-needed time to research each guest and make each interview a unique experience. So if you appreciate the work that we're doing here, why not come on board as a Patreon supporter today? You can do that by contributing $5, $10, or $20 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash thecanderframe. Just $5 a month from you makes a big difference. Thank you, as always, for your support. I, I can't help but feel, at least f for me, is is that I, I don't think I'm faced with it, those kind of difficult choices right now. Mm -hmm. And like you, I, I say, I hope that I'm prepared, you know, when that moment comes to make a hard decision like that. But I think that the work that I've been putting in personally has been about living a life of integrity. It's, been, a, it's been about being a good husband, being a good son, a good brother, a good friend. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this has been the biggest thing, being willing to be accountable when I fall short. Hmm. And not coming up with excuses, yeah. Accepting yeah. responsibility and yeah. whatever consequences are the result of that, and that yeah. that was that's that was a hard lesson. But I realized that if I, but I realized that if I wanted to become the kind of person that I wanted to be, that had to be part of the narrative. Yeah, and I feel like it's it's helped me to make the right choices when I'm faced with small struggle. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think that if you're making those, those choices with the small struggles, that when the big yeah. ones come, at least I hope that it will it'll allow me to sh make the right choices. Cause if you're not making the right choices with the small struggles, you sure <laughs> as hell are not going to do when the big ones come. <laughs> no, you're right. But, but at that point you're battle tested, as we say, Yeah, you, you know who you are. And even if the battle test was from a few skirmishes, as opposed to World War II, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those skirmishes are defining. And collectively, they, to me, I think, present enough evidence to you about who you are. And so from those skirmishes, those, those little challenges and how we respond to them, yeah. we are taking notes about ourselves. And, and, and it's good to have the skirmishes because you may take a note about something that you realize you don't like about how you're responding. So now you have an opportunity before the big wave comes mm -hmm. to work on that. Oh yeah. To uh -huh. change that. And and ultimately I, I 
I think all of us find something that we're not that crazy about, something that we need to evolve in, something that that we realize that if I don't do this now, when the big wave come, I may not be able to handle that. And the only way we can know that is because of those little skirmishes. And that's why I think they're as defining, especially collectively, mm-hmm. if you're consistently responding the same way, a- as one big one. They're as informative uh, to, to who we are um, as the big event when it comes. But I do believe that we all have to take note, whether the skirmish is small or whether the, the, the battle is big, how we are responding to these things in our lives when they come. Because that, that to me is life saying, hello, here's who you are. Yeah. Here's who you are. Here's what you need to work on. And I'm preparing you for the bigger wave that's coming. And that to me is why I do believe that these situations should never be dismissed. Like you said, accountability, answering for it, being there, I blew it. Yeah. And I need to work on that. Uh, I, I've done that many times, mostly to myself, because there was always this sense that, like you, my mother and father were divorced. Uh, and it was because there was a period of time where my father, who held it all inside, was not answering the bell, but it was because he himself was being beat down and lost his job. And he defined himself as a man by his work, Mm -hmm. especially in that generation and the generation before. If you're not working, you're a bum. I mean, not only did men carry that, that stigma, women believed it too. So the first thing a woman would say to a woman who found a man is what kind of job does he have? Or if you should leave the man is, well, leave him. He ain't got no job. So this notion of work defining relevance or validity yeah. in life, my father took that to heart. So when he wasn't able to kind of step up and be the breadwinner, bring home the bacon, so to speak, hand over the check, he began to shrink. But it was a private death. And I saw that. And so what I did and do to this day is whenever I say, hmm, I blew that, I need to work on that, it's usually private. I don't confess it publicly to my children, yeah. to my wife. That's probably something I should do more of, uh, Eva, if, if nothing else, to instruct my sons, not by lecture, but by just watching me. Yeah. Right? To let them know it's okay to do this. And, and if, I, if I'm successful at that, I'm literally upping the ante because my father got less than that from his father. And then he maybe stepped it up a little bit, but... I think I have to start being more vocal with my sons. Just like you, I I don't verbalize that. I'm getting better at it. But I think that... For the same reasons? For the same reasons, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I I find that with some of the people in which I sometimes do it, it's it's, I see something of of that in them. Hmm. Maybe not exactly the same circumstances, but it's just like I I think think what's important to me is that I don't have to explain it. Yes. They get it. Even if it's not yes. exactly their experience, yeah. they get it. And that's sometimes all that I need to be that's able comforting. to give voice to it. Just because I don't want to spend half my energy justifying and explaining how I'm, Absolutely. I, I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know a lot of photographers, and a lot of photographers who I, I consider friends, but I have to say that there are very, very few who I can consider really intimate friends yeah you know yeah. and you know we both are in la so we kind of know the kind of faux people that are out there who smile <laughs> at you and talk about you or tweet about you the next next right. moment right right and you know you got to interact with all of these people yeah uh, it's in yeah. both of our industries and i'm and i'm wondering how you have sort of navigated that, especially with respect to who do you allow to get close to you? Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a good one. And I think that, I think um, people like us, people in our industries, you're right. We, we, we encounter hundreds of people uh, either professionally or socially, just, just because of the nature of what we do, but the decision to let people into our sphere, that's, that's a personal one. Now for me, I mentioned my story earlier about becoming more and more guarded, the more and more I realized people either didn't care or would sort of beat down any any dreams that I have. So I became self-reliant. 
I became very, very selective about when I allowed myself to potentially to be vulnerable. Well, I carry that to this day that, you know, I had one ride or die friend, Howard Ransom Jr. Bless his heart. He was the brother from another mother and was close was as close to me as my my blood brothers, he unfortunately passed away. I asked myself, I delivered his eulogy, but I asked myself afterwards, what was it about Howard that allowed me to, you know, open the door and say, this is my dude. And I could probably give you some stuff, but it's so visceral. It's just so visceral who that person is and why you you open up the door to them versus that person or that person. So I, I can't touch it in terms of saying, oh, that's the absolute definition of why. It, there's a magic to it. And for me, I run into, I have different layers of relationships. I have really good relationships with people who are I consider in that outer ring. Yeah. And then as the rings get closer and closer to me, there are fewer and fewer people. And on that inner ring, there's only a couple. And, but, and that's by my choice. That's not because the other folks aren't worthy of it. And by that, I mean that they don't have the characteristics that would qualify them for being in my inner circle. It's just on me. Mm-hmm. It's just the magic. Whatever that last bit of magic that I can't control, I don't feel it with those other people. But those two or three on the inside, I could be absolutely emotionally naked. Yeah. And they would lift me up. They would not hurt me. They would not criticize me. They they would lift me up. It's it's like the giving tree. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure if you know that story. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're the tree, Eva. They're the tree. Those are those kind of people. When I r- read and reread that story, I think of my mother, obviously. So... Those kinds of people, to me, are the greatest human beings on the planet, first of all. And if I'm fortunate enough to have them in my sphere, and for a period of time, I can guarantee you those people who are on the innermost circles of my life, because those are the people I trust most with my vulnerability, with my secrets, with my whatever it is. Those qualities, the giving, it has to be a giver. It has to be a, a person of kindness of love of generosity when i see that kind of spirit is so nurturing that you can't help but fall into the arms of it mm-hmm. and and uh, and allow yourself to be kin with it and then feel fortunate to have somebody like that uh in your life my, my wife helen is 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 that way for me though that goes into me to my visceral determination of who uh, I allow in. Yeah. Well, one of the things. You? Well, I was going to say that uh, one of the things that makes us very uh, similar is we make good choices in women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> I know yours. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I was going to say that that I think that that for me that the blessing of having people where I've been able to be genuine, to be honest, to be naked hmm. in the way that you describe. Hmm has made me has really transformed how I do things in terms of the work that I that I do. Yeah. Because being completely genuine, honest, and in the moment has become a greater priority for me than wow. anything else. It's not so much that the end result of the work satisfies some sort of barometer for me. Mm-hmm. It's about what was the experience like yeah. when I'm teaching the journey? The journey. Yeah. The journey. When I'm teaching and when I'm shooting, I, I, I talk about, you know, being in a certain headspace in a certain zone where I am free of any sort of judgments or negativity or voices. It's just, I'm just there. I'm just present. I'm alive in that, in that moment yeah. in a way that I'm, uh, that I'm not otherwise. And yeah. that is, is extending itself in so many aspects of, of my life. Yeah. And you know, I think that's important. I think it's very yeah. important. And I know that there, there, there's a, there's an actor who I saw, um, Stephen Ryder. I saw him in a play at South Pasadena about four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's up and coming actor, really, really talented. And he was doing a two man play, and I was watching him, 
and he was there. Yeah. He was he was present because even yeah. when he didn't have yeah. a line, yeah, he was there throughout the whole thing, and yeah. it was just like I just latched in. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it wasn't so much his performance, how he was reading lines or his body language. It was just yeah. the fact that that's the space. I recognized the space that he was yeah. in in that yeah. moment. And I can't help but feel that that, especially as an actor, that that has, that that's something that's, that's precious to you because it, it's where your best performance can come from. But I really would love to, to hear about what that process is for you. Well, the, first of all, the end goal was the purpose that I started acting. I didn't realize that at 13, but given the divorce and everything that was happening, it was like, it was like the perfect storm for me to go left or right. Mm -hmm. And at that point in my life, drama was introduced. And so I went in that direction. But my whole pursuit in this art, I now realize, was A, to discover me. Even before I discovered the world, and I realized that they came hand in hand, but I had to discover who I was. And I realized I could do that vicariously by taking on all of these different roles, mm -hmm. exploring each one of them, digging into the 360 degrees of each one of my characters, and in the process, better understand why I do some of the things I do. Why my father, who has passed away now, who I understand so much more now than when he was alive and I hadn't gone yeah. through this process. So this understanding of life and people and, and myself, that is what has been the greatest byproduct of acting, the, every role. And I've played at this point just about every conceivable role, it, the transvestites, uh, 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 pimps, a uh, um, uh, uh, clergy, uh, 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 president of the United States, uh, you name it, a, a bum on the street, a homeless man. I've played them. And, and part of playing them is to get into them, to understand how you get there. And when you're there, how do you survive? What, is, what does this do to your self-esteem? What is it? So an actor who really is a good actor is saying, I need to, for this role, sacrifice or set aside who I am. And I need to bring to life and unearth this character, A, so that I can present this man in as honest a portrayal as I can. In other words, be there, be mm -hmm. in the moment with him, but B, and maybe more importantly, so that those who watch it can believe it and learn from it and cry if they need to cry, and laugh if they need to laugh. So the therapy goes both ways. The therapy that I get from playing this man and saying, ah, that's why my father was in so much pain. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's why my uncle drank. Ah, 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 that's why I... And then the audience looks at that and goes home and says, I need to change my life. I realized, Eva, years ago, this is a powerful medium. It is one of the most powerful, and for me as the actor, it's free therapy over and over mm. and over again. And the more I go through this therapeutic process, the more I'm healed. And we all need that therapy. We all need that healing. I get mine every time I put on a new wardrobe, every time, only because I've invested myself in the commitment of fleshing out this character 360 degrees. Yeah. And in order to do that, like the actor you mentioned, you got to be present. You got to be there. You can't be, well, how do I look on camera? Uh, blah, 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 blah. You, you have to be into that character. So that's why every time I book a role, I'm playing a role now uh, on 911 Lone Star. And when I looked at the script, where the character is introduced, I thought, oh, this is beautiful. He's such a flawed man. And in his story arc, he will be redeemed. Redemption is one of the themes that I'm always drawn to, whether I'm in the audience watching a movie, a play, yeah. or whatever. The character who is redeemed. Or if I'm playing that character, I get a chance to go through the redemption viscerally. I cry most often when I'm playing those characters, the natural tears which often works for the for, for the scene, or if it doesn't, we'll do another take. But 
Those are my tears, though, because either I still need redemption or I know somebody who does. Yeah. And I need to be more empathetic about that person. I've often run to people after I finish a play or a, a, a television show or a film, call somebody and said, I'm sorry. For what? Mm. I mean, they, they, they assume we're good and we're good. But I usually follow it with this. I didn't know. I'm sorry, I didn't know. And I have to explain to them, because they didn't see it coming, what it is I think I've learned about what they're going through. And so I begin just this Q&A with them based on what I've learned about that space. Yeah. And then they can then begin to tweak it with what's unique about what they're going through. But, but the generalities are the same. And that's when they begin to, to, to let tears go, because they didn't realize people saw them. And I didn't until I went through this process. And that's why I come to them to say, I'm sorry. I, I did not know you were going through whatever the general thing it is you're going through. Do you want to talk about it? Because I'm now ready to listen. The process that I just went through made me now capable of hearing what you have to say. That, to me, makes this acting profession that I'm involved in so evolutionary. Yeah. I've evolved so much as a human being doing this more than I think that I would have if I was a plumber, if I was a street sweeper, if I was a, not that you can't grow in those areas, but this profession forces you to grow. If you commit to it, you will learn, you cannot be the same person after having gone through the empathetic process of becoming these people, the drunk. My father drank uh, for a period of time in his life, and it, it got bad. And I realized my father didn't drink just to get drunk. My father drank to run away. He drank to forget. Mm -hmm. And there was no other way he knew. There was no other way. It's just you pick your, pick your choice. So for some people, it's heroin. For some people, it's whatever. For some people, it's religion. It, whatever we get lost in that can keep us from, and I'm only talking about those people who use religion as an escape, who never come home, who spend every day of the week at church, who don't know how to come home because they still don't know how to face the issues there. So that becomes alcohol. That becomes heroin. That becomes, so whatever someone's drug of choice is, I began to understand by playing those people. It ain't even about the drug of choice. It's the reason why you pick it up. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go to them and say, talk to me. Not about drinking, not about shooting up, but about the genesis of it. Let's go back. And that's all a therapist does. I don't mind. I'm not going to judge you as this or that. I'm here to take you back to the beginning of whatever created the need for this. Yeah. And that's where I wish I had my father back with me now to go back with him to talk about it. Even if he goes back to his childhood, I would really learn more. Yeah. And all I would do is listen. Eba. I would just listen. I wouldn't judge at all because that's another thing in acting. You can't judge the character you play. You just have to play them and find their justification for doing it. They don't see themselves as a bad person. They don't see themselves as a drunk. They don't see themselves as just a, a whore. They see themselves a different way. I want to find out that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's why I continue to love this, this profession. Yeah, for me, it's when I'm making photographs, whether it's like a street photograph or doing a portrait, Yeah. it's, it's about being in the moment. That certainly is, is, is a big factor. Yeah. But, there, but more specifically, it's... It's a sense, like, say, for example, there's a street photograph that I'm making. There, I'm at a street corner. I love the line and the shape and the color and the people. There are people flitting around. And all of a sudden, there's these, these two elements, maybe two people walking down the street corner. And I can see that they're about to meet at the corner. And something in my gut says, something might happen. Hmm. And then that moment comes. And I make it and I press the button and I make the photograph. Yeah. And 
And all of a sudden, all of those things came together. And part of it is can only come from being completely present. But yeah. there's something that I love about that feeling of anticipation. It's like spidey senses. You know, like Spider-Man <laughs> gets spidey senses. And it's just like, and there's like this nervous energy. It's just like something could happen just now. Yeah. And then it does. And, split, and, and it's like a split second right before it happens. I press the button. Or when I'm making a portrait. You know, I'm engaging with the person, yeah. but I'm constantly looking and observing. And there's something about their change in expression, the tilt of the head, something that yeah. changes in the eyes. And there's something about being able to get that moment. It's satisfying when I do. Yeah. But like I said before, it's that process. It's that feeling. Yeah. When it's all, it's all happening and I can feel it in yeah. my gut. And it's, it's really um, intoxicating. Let me ask you a question then. I, I wondered this about photographers. We're kindred artists. Um, I've heard artists talk, uh, photographers talk a lot about that moment. Yeah. And, you know, and them wanting to have the right equipment without lag and all of that, because you don't want to miss that moment. And so the moment becomes everything. The greatest Pulitzer Prize winning pho photographs and, and, yeah. and, and, and the photographs were about a moment. I remember one that was on the cover of, of Life magazine during the Vietnam War about this kid running down the street and in the background, this devastation. And the photographer said, he said, I didn't even know it was coming. I heard something, a child screaming. I just turned. And oh, I, yeah, that's Nick Oot. He made that uh, figure of, of uh, yes. the na napalm girl. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. The napalm girl. I believe yeah. that won the Pulitzer. I believe it did. But but my point is this. As a photographer, you know these moments. You just described a moment and you capture it. And and the camera is just a tool, but the sense of the photographer to know a moment mm -hmm. or even through serendipity to be blessed with a moment just happened. You, you happen to have the camera there. Right. My question, though, is this, Eba, has that helped you in your personal life to recognize a moment that yeah. is happening to you? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you because know. it's like I know and what it's it not, feels. It's not about photographing it, no, but it's not, about yeah, right, exactly. Because I know what it feels like to be present, hmm. to not be hmm. hearing all the noise, right? It's yeah. like especially now, it's like I can always pick up my phone and take a look at getting distracted or look at something and just 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 to fill in the the time. And sometimes yeah. let me just sit here. That's you a know? moment. Let me just listen. Let me just look. I just I think it was yesterday. I was coming off the deck to come down here. And there was Mockingbird up on the line. And I just stopped and I just looked at him for a while. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's just like, and I just appreciated a moment, just the moment. Yeah. And it's like, because yeah. I, I see moments all the time and most of them, I don't photograph them. Right? Hmm. But it's just about what the joy comes from the recognition of the moment, not necessarily having to make a photograph every time. Yeah. Because everything is not a moment, right? Not everything, no, no. But there are there there are just these these things that, that that can happen, and you just go, yeah. If I made a photograph, that might be a good photograph. But I just want to take it in. I just want yeah. to soak it in. You know, yeah. my dog. I've been letting my dog up in the bed in the morning. Yeah. She comes up, and she will just come up, and she'll nuzzle me, and she'll put her nose right in my armpit, <laughs> right, and she'll bury her nose in there. And I can just feel her breathing underneath my arm. And wow! And I just sit there with my eyes closed, and I feel that hot breath underneath my arm, and I just take it in. And it's just, it's it's special. And it's something that yeah. I'm just, I'm just yeah. enjoying. And, and um, but the fact that, the fact that you recognize that and can appreciate it, do you attribute that just to your, your innate something or has photography? has looking through that viewfinder over the years and discerning the moment through the yeah. viewfinder helped you to recognize and appreciate Absolutely, it because I don't think yeah. I would have learned what it feels like or what it's supposed to be like unless mm. I had been looking through the camera. I would have, yeah. I have, I would have had no way of being able to relate it to anything. And because yeah. I know it through the camera, when other, other moments happen, yeah. I get it. So, yeah, I don't think I yeah. ever would have figured that out without without the camera. 
Yeah, yeah. there is a the the poet Alexander uh, Pope whose stuff I love. Let me read you something real quick. We're talking about these moments. Okay. Um, to get and this is on the essay on man and what he's doing is prescribing to 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 us what he believes we should be focusing on in life. Together, let us beat this ample field. Try what the open, what the covert yield, the latent tracks, the giddy heights explore of all who blindly creep or sightless soar. I nature's walk, shoot folly as it flies and catch the moments living as they rise. And when you were talking, I, I, I said, oh, let me go to that because I remember when I first read that, that he is saying, don't miss, I'm paraphrasing basically, yeah. don't miss the collateral beauty all around you. Catch the moments living as they rise because mm-hmm. they're not going to last forever. And that again, to the photographer who says, oh man, you want to be ready because you don't know when these moments are coming. And, and, and when they do, you want to catch them as they rise. You with the two strangers coming at the intersection of the corner, you want to catch the moment, Right. Catch the moment as it rises, because if you don't, you miss it. Yeah. It doesn't mean there aren't other moments to come, but you miss that one. Your daughter's graduation for the people. Oh, man, I wish I had been there. The boom, boom, boom. Oh, I I, or the people who were alcoholics who say I've, I've played an alcoholic who go to, to, to AA and in the meeting, they just say, I'm just so hurt for the moments in my life that I missed that I can never get back. Mm-hmm. And then they begin to list it. My my son, blah 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 blah. My this, so they know what the moments are, but they also equally rec, rec, r- r- lament the fact that they miss those moments. And I think that's really the key. And and it goes to you saying, "I want to be present." To me, mm-hmm. you're saying, "I don't want to miss those moments." Will yeah. I want to be there, man? I want my life, my physical life won't last forever. So there are going to be some beautiful moments. I may miss a couple, but man, I want to be as in tune as possible so that I can catch those moments as they rise and then appreciate it. Well, the last question I ask each guest is I usually ask them to name a photographer, but you can name anyone, an artist that you think listeners should check out on their, on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've recently discovered or someone you've long admired. Wow. That's, that's a good one. I like your work. (laughs) I am serious. (laughs) Uh, when I was introduced to particularly your street photography, which you do a lot of, it seems to me, I've seen a picture of a wall that you took. And I can't remember what it was. Somebody was walking by a wall and there was a car nearby. And I thought, this is a simple enough scene, but there's something about the way you capture the seemingly simple moments allows me to then go in and fill in the space. Your photography, to me, provides the backdrop that invites people to come in and fill in that space so that no two people who watch it are going to come away with that artistic experience with the same picture. It's it's not going to be the same picture. I love the way you don't lead the viewer or the audience, if I can say that, mm. that you provide the framework the background. I love the simplicity of your work. I love that you are consistent with that. I haven't seen you go radically different over the years with your work. Uh, I had the the fortune of having you uh, do some some portrait photography of me at my home. And I love the fact that you were just talking to me and I would be saying something and all of a sudden I'd hear, I'd look off and I'd hear a click. And I just my initial instinct was, oh, I wish he had caught me when I had turned. But then basically that would be the instinct that tells me I would have wanted to prepare for it. But I think that that's consistent with the street photography. You don't you don't catch it well prepared. You don't catch it uh, uh, pretentiously. You catch it as it is. And then you allow people to fill it in. To me, the greatest artists that I've seen um, whether they be writers, whether they be directors, whether they be painters, whether they be whatever, don't want to fill in all of the stuff for you because all mm-hmm. that says yeah. is this is what I'm thinking about life. I think those artists, including you, are more interested in what people have to say with filling in the space themselves. And so 
I would want people to see your works, to the books you published, to to take a look at that and and allow themselves to then explore not only the nature of your work, but the curious revelation of how they fill in the space that you've allowed them to do by creating the backdrop. And then see what it tells them about themselves. Because if art doesn't reveal something to us about ourselves, what are we doing? Just admiring Renoir, Van Gogh? I, yeah, okay, we could do that. But art has to. My work, I, you got it. The art, the, the art is really to teach the viewer something about themselves. And I like that yours does that in such a, an understated way with beautiful colors and, and all of that, but just the backdrop. So again, I would invite people to explore your photography and see what it teaches them, what it lends them in the way of, I like um, Ibadio Nex's work because I didn't know these things about me. Mm. And the artist that reveals stuff to us, whether it be an actor or whatever, that's the work that I seek out. I, I, because I'm, I'm in a mode of self-discovery constantly. So that that would that would be it. Uh, oh, thank you for that, brother, and thank you for your yeah. time. I love you so much. Oh man, Eva, it's, it's 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 my pleasure. Thank you for just uh, creating this space and just having a kind of conversation where we really talk to each other and listen. Because I do so much PR, and it's usually about the thirty second sound bite. Yeah. So they so we literally have these made up answers to these to the questions that are the same questions over and over again this is such a beautiful thing uh, because of the nature of art but also because of the nature of our relationship i, I do i do appreciate it. thanks to william for joining us you can see him currently as a cast regular on 911 lone star on the fox network but you can also view his long list of credits on IMDb. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. We also provide a series of eBooks on photography available for purchase on our website, it's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candor Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candor Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.